I'm a second year Eigert student and I work in the kinesiology department and specifically in a muscle, muscle physiology lab. And today I would like to share some um, exciting data that I've collected over the last about year um, and hopefully su supportive evidence to um, tell the story that uh, muscle derived mesenchymal stem cells do contribute to vascular growth in response to mechanical strain. Um, in order to tell this story, I'm uh, going to give you some context to put that in, as all good stories need context. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we work with a mouse animal model, and specifically an alpha-7 alpha seven transgenic overexpressing mouse. And a, a uh, alpha-7 integrin is a transmembrane protein that connects the uh, extracellular matrix with the inside of the cell, the actin cytoskeleton. And one of the first observations that we made, um, coincidentally, not something we were looking for, was that these, cell, these mice have an increased level of muscle-derived mesenchymal stem cells, um, both at the basal level and in response to mechanical strain, so exercise. And if you can see that that graph shows you, there's a fourfold increase when compared to basal levels of a wild-type mouse. Um, another interesting thing uh, was that when we saw increases of those cells, we saw enhanced or accelerated myogenesis. And um, this is shown here, two days after one bout of exercise, we see an increase in embryonic mice and heavy chain positive fibers, which is just a marker for uh, new fiber growth. So uh, that's kind of where we started. A little bit more about the cells themselves. They are CD45 negative, meaning they don't come from the bone marrow and they are SCA1 positive, which is a ubiquitous stem cell marker. Uh, these cells seem to have all the key markers for a mesenchymal phenotype. When we plate them, they adhere to culture plastic, and we can biochemically direct their differentiation into adipocytes, chondrocytes, and osteoblasts. Also, to further characterize those cells, we looked at both genetic and protein expression of certain markers, and in the the uh, PCR data you can see when compared to primary cells from muscle, they don't show expression of specific, um, some key, I can't find my arrow, there we go, there it is, key uh, myogenic regulatory factors, the MyoD MIF5, so they're very different from these primary cells, but they do express high levels of um, mesenchymal markers, meaning uh, being CD90, 105, 73, and 29. And then looking over at the flow cytometry data, um, you can see, again, they show high levels of SCOT1 expression. They don't show CD56 expression, which is important because that excludes them from being satellite cells, which is that, that um, cell type that most people attribute muscle growth to. Uh, but they also express CD90 in high, high percentages, and more specifically, parasite markers CD41. Uh, CD140B, CD146, and NG2. So phenotypically mesenchymal-like and more specifically they're parasites. And uh, one of our key observations was that they are very sensitive to their microenvironment, which is true of all stem cells. But um, what this data shows is that on gelatin, which is uh, bas basically collagen, uh, they increase their myogenic markers in response to strain. Um, so they're both substrate and mechanical strain um, influenced, and you don't see that when you plate them on laminin. Um, but when you plate them on gelatin versus laminin, uh, they do show increases in those stem cell markers. So they're very in tune to their microenvironment, and that helps direct um, what these cell types are going to be. Um, so to artificially or um, exogenously increase these numbers in wild type, uh, numbers of these cells in wild type mice, we did a short study where we injected them into wild type mice and looked at that myogenic potential as well. And we showed, um, as you can see in the bottom picture again, those embryonic mice and heavy chain positive fibers only in the cell injected legs. And so yes, these cells do have myogenic potential when you place them in a myogenic microenvironment. Uh, but again, going back to the idea of context, um, it's important to note that when we um, find them in their natural habitat or their natural microenvironment, we're actually finding them in and around vessels. 
Um, and that led me to this current project. Um, yes, these, stu these cells do have myogenic potential um, and are influenced by their microenvironment, but where we're specifically finding them is in and around the vessels. So my questions were, do these cells have cardiovascular potential to grow the vasculature, maybe to support the myogenic um, potential that they have? Um, and if they do have that potential, um, what are the mechanisms and by which these um, adaptations take place? So uh, to investigate this um, further, I use the same two-pronged approach, both in vivo and in vitro um, models. The in vivo model allows the cells to stay in their natural microenvironment that's very complex with several different cues. And we use downhill running um, as a means of mechanically straining them in that microenvironment. And then we'll do histology and protein analysis on those tissues. And then the second um, approach is the in vitro approach where we extract those cells, we fax sort them, and then we plate them on bio um, membranes that are flexible and we can um, more uh, ha have more regulation over their mi microenvironment to figure out which of the, the cues are most important. And um, the protocol for that is five hours of strain, 10% biaxial, biaxial strain at one hertz. And then we do um, immunocytochemistry, protein analysis of the um, condition media. Uh, just to further define my terms just a little bit, uh, I'm sure most of you are aware of the, the idea of myogenesis, that biological process, where you have increases in capillary number. Um, and it's, the key for this is they're coming from where there were no capillaries, there now are capillaries. They're brand new capillaries. And this is going to increase oxygen diffusion potential to the tissue itself. The way that I measure that is I do a CD31 stain, which positively marks the endothelial cells. And I count capillaries, I count fibers, and I do capillary to fiber ratios. Um, and these are common um, biological measures for this phenomenon. Um, capillary density, which is the number of capillaries per area of tissue. And then another one of uh, index of tortuosi tortuosity, which is um, how complex do the, um, the two contact each other? Is there more, what's the, the percentage of contact between the capillary and the muscle fiber? Um, and that helps take into consideration the longitudinal um, cross section. So if you see most of those capillaries are small punctate dots as they're transversely cut with the tissue, but some of them don't run exactly um, parallel to that transverse section. So the tortuosity index takes that into consideration. Uh, probably a term you're a little bit less familiar with is arteriogenesis. And um, what I want you to just keep in mind is that this is going to be a remodeling of pre-existing collateral arteries. Um, and the way that I measure that is by looking at CD31 positive vessels, which again is that endothelial marker, or NG2 positive um, vessels, which again, if you remember, is a marker for those, those parasites. And that's going to be a marker for remodeling of, of existing um, vasculature. And in order for them to be counted as a larger vessel in arteriogenesis, I'm going to have to have a visible lumen, which you wouldn't see in a capillary. And they're positive for one of those two markers. So here are the results um, of the histology analysis. So um, this isn't what I was expecting. I assumed that if we're going to have increases in muscle fibers, we're going to have to increase the blood flow to them. So I ex actually kind of expected to see increases in angiogenesis. but the common theme through all of this is either slight decreases or no change at all. Um, whether I measure it through capillary density, capillary to fiber ratios, or through tor tortuosity. Um, but interestingly, when you look at the large vessels, um, you see no change with the wild type mice in response to an acute bout of exercise. But with the alpha 7 transgenic mice, where we have an increase in those cell numbers, those mesenchymal stem cell markers, um, you see an increase in the number of vessels with CD31 positive staining. And again, I've said this a couple of times, but NG2 being a marker of those parasites, so it's going to be a marker of remodeling um, as they associate with the vessels. And this is what it looks like. Again, you see, where's my little arrow? The green right here is the NG2, and it's incorporating into this vessel where you can see the lumen. And it's easier to see over on the screen over here. but these are outlines of fibers with the strophin being the co-stain for that, that image. Uh, but those are the vessels that I was counting. 
and more data needs to be added to this before I can test for significance, but it appears that there is an increase seven days after um, a single bout of exercise in the transgenic mice alone. And that is also supported with um, protein analysis. So 24 hours after the um, single bout of exercise where we see that enhanced um, expression of the mesenchymal stem cells, uh, you see positive or greater increases, significant in increases in the transgenic mice, um, supporting that we're having, there's a greater number of parasites in those mice. Does that make sense? So to um, increase the number of cells in wild type, since they don't see the same amount of increases as the transgenic mice, again, we injected the cells into the mice, um, having them be, been labeled with dye eye so we could visually see where they went in the muscle, and then did those same measures for angiogenesis or arteriogenesis. And same trends that you saw with uh, the, tr the, uh, the wheel run samples, you see a decrease or no change in all of the measures of angiogenesis. But when I look at large vessel um, increases, you see increased increases in the cell injected pre-exercise mice. Um, and this is just something that I need to follow up on, but again, they're intramuscular injections, but it appears that they're finding their way back to their, their preferred microenvironment. So they're homing to those vessels themselves. Um, and then when I did the NG2, um, analysis, also more data needs to be added to this to look at significance, but there does appear to be an increase in the remodeled vessels when we inject the cells. So just to summarize for the uh, in vivo work, um, whether we enhanced the number of cells through downhill running or we enhanced it by artificial or by transplanting the cells into wild type mice, we see increases of those cells um, that for angiogenic adaptation leads to either no change or slight decreases. Um, and I guess this is a good time to say, um, even though we think of angiogenesis being an adaptation for exercise, keep in mind that this is downhill running. So the, the point of this exercise is to cause load under strain and it's mechanical strain induced adaptation rather than increased oxidative need. So um, even though it's what it wasn't what I was expecting to see those decreases, um, these papers show that when you have that increased load on those muscles, you're going to have capillary apoptosis or you're going to have decreased functions of apoptosis. So it seems to be in line with what the literature says, even though that's not what I expected. Um, but as far as arteriogenesis is concerned, um, which is the remodeling of the vessels, we saw when there was an increase in the cells, we saw increases in large vessels, and that was true of CD31 positive vessels or NG2 positive vessels. So just uh, to remind you, there are several layers to the left to um, a actual artery, a larger artery than a capillary. You have the endothelial layer, smooth muscle layer, and then also the extracellular matrix uh, along with the parasites, and that's where we're finding our cells. Um, whether they're expressed um, by downhill running, that, that mechanical strain in vivo, or whether we're injecting them, that's where they're finding um, their way to. And arteriogenesis, again, is an enlargement of an existing vessel, and it's going to increase the blood flow capacity to downstream tissue, so it's a beneficial adaptation. And um, the mechanisms required for this is increased endothelial or smooth muscle um, proliferation and growth as well as extracellular matrix remodeling. And um, interestingly, the, the, the stimulus for this is not hypoxia as it is for angiogenesis. It's more that mechanical strain is leading to um, these environmental cues to cause this adaptation to take place. So taking that into consideration, we move to the cell culture in vitro model to further elucidate what mechanisms might be involved in this adaptation that we're seeing. And remember, we're going to flex those SCA1 positive CD45 negative cells and then um, look at potential mechanisms, which would be mechanical regulations of stemness, which if you remember, I showed you before that uh, in response to strain on laminin, we increase SCA1 markers and CD90 markers. Um, you also have the release of factors to increase growth and remodeling. So this would be a paracrine 
um, indirect uh, method, and then also release of factors that are going to uh, influence proliferation of those two cell types that are part of the artery. So um, this first image um, shows, and again, it's easier to see on the screen over here. This one's a little bit dark. But uh, when we plated ourselves on the uh, BioFlex membranes and we strained them, it seems that using uh, smooth muscle actin as our marker of differentiation, that when we strain the cells, there was an inhibition of that differentiation process. So you see more smooth muscle actin in the non-strained controls, uh, which I find very interesting. Um, and the follow-up to this is I have these cells um, isolated, and I'll be doing actual quantitation of this um, to see um, if my representative images are actually representing what's happening at the protein level. Uh, also, we took the condition media from um, these two conditions, and um, you can see that there's a lot of data here, and I have a lot more work to do. Um, but just to highlight a few things that um, there's increases in um, a lot of factors that are responsible for growth and proliferation of these two cell types, as well as increases in um, the MMPs, is the ones I'm highlighting right there, that are, are responsible for extracellular matrix remodeling. So the follow-up to this is I'm waiting for um, some smooth muscle cells to, to, to get to the point where I can do studies with them so I have enough number, um, and I'm going to add the condition media to this and assess proliferation and, um, and different protein expressions on the, of these cells. Um, so in conclusion, um, I've shown that SCAL1 positive, CD45 negative, mesenchymal stem cells have multi-lineage potential. We saw that, that they have both myogenic and vascular potential. Um, and their preferred location is the vascular niche, in which I think that is very relevant to studying these, is understanding why are they there and, and what at, um, what are the, what, why are they in the vascular niche is one of the questions that I have. Um, and in response to strain, the MSCs maintain their stemness. Um, we saw that both through um, in, immunocytochemistry and uh, through some PCR data. And they also release a lot of factors that are responsible for growth and proliferation as well as extracellular matrix remodeling. Um, when strained, and that they appear to play a critical role in vessel growth. And I guess to sum all that up, why I'm excited about this project and why um, I think that it's important is I feel that, that um, we're showing that MSCs, given the right environmental cues, have um, the potential to be key regulators in a well-orchestrated regenerative program, which I know is a lot to say, but I think we can get there. So I just want to thank uh, the people in my lab specifically. My advisor, Marty Bopart, and Jun Kong, who's my co-advisor for the IGERT, um, in all of their direction on this project, and for all of my undergrads and colleagues that have helped me collect a lot of data. So any questions? So we isolate the gastroc soleus complex, which is the um, muscle in the back of the leg of the mouse. And then I mechanically mince it up and then enzymatically digest it. And then I add SCA1 positive, or SCA1 and CD45 antibodies and then fax sort it based on their expression of those antibodies that are attached to fluorophores. Yes? So when you have it's not done in our field, but I'm not going to say that it's not possible. <laughs> um, I mean, how do you correlate that amount of activity in some quantitative manner to the results? Is it right. That's a good question to quantitatively do. I mean, we can do it with qualitative evidence showing that in the wild type, there's a lot of there's an increase in um, muscle damage, um, and we have a lot of markers for muscle damage, but that shows that there was strain on those fibers surrounding the vessels and surrounding the cells. So I guess we can show evidence for the strain, but we ha at this point don't quantify it. But it might be an engineering thing to do. <laughs> Would it be possible to look at bone density, or is the training regimen, does that not take place? 
that for over, over an extended period of time? Um, it might be with a training model. The, right, what I showed you was just a single bout, and I doubt there would be right, any yeah, changes yeah, in the yeah. bone density with a single bout. But there, I mean, there are some models to, to do that as well, like um, to increase bone density. So I guess there would be, there might be a correlation between bone increases in bone density and strain. But I don't know how you put a number to that. You just say there was an increase here, so there must have been increased strain. That makes sense. Questions from UC Merced? Okay. So, yes. Can you just sort of uh, hypothesize and postulate and kind of project in the future of how this might translate to human studies or any sort of therapeutic intervention? Or what would be the, you know, right. if you were widely successful, how would this? Which is a given. <laughs> um, my my goal my goal with this project and a lot of the, the projects that I'm involved in is understanding what is it that these cells need, what cues do they need to be able to have their beneficial effect. So maybe it's pre-straining them before injection. Maybe it's certain substrates um, binding to these cells in their new microenvironment. The problem is the the application is to treat either diseased or aged individuals where the microenvironment is poor. So understanding in a a correctly adaptive model of a young healthy mouse and learning what what cues are important um, is hopefully going to lead me into being able to kind of do co-therapies where we're doing some treatment to the cell or we're co-injecting with some agent that allows them to have the cues that they need to have their beneficial effect. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Let's thank our speaker again.